Butler's. We have many supporters, uh, senior staff uh, uh, from the Wilson Center, especially the fearless leader of the Middle East Project, uh, Halez Fandiari. Uh, our scholars track the ever-shifting tectonic plates of the Middle East on a daily basis. Ne nearly half of our ground truth briefings, featuring experts in hotspots around the globe commenting on breaking news as it unfolds, have focused on Egypt, Iran, the peace process, and Syria. Our Middle East program has held 63 events in this last year alone, about half of them this week, I think, uh, and it follows events on the ground in Syria very closely. Uh, recent speakers include Israeli Minister, Minister of Intelligence Yuval Steinitz, USAID Administrator Raj Shaw, the EU High Representative Foreign Affairs Catherine Ashton, Homeland Security Secretary Jay Johnson, who made headlines at, Wilson, at the Wilson Center when he said, quote, Syria has now become a matter of homeland security. But with more than 130,000 dead, Syria is much more. It is a moral catastrophe. And as the New York Times reported, 42 percent of all Syrians, 42 percent of all Syrians, more than the population of New York City, have fled their homes. In the U.S., this is equivalent to 131 million Americans on the move. As, as a former nine-term member of Congress who served on most of the security committees, I personally would like to see a more forceful administration policy. I think we raised expectations in Libya, and when that happened, it should have set some sort of precedent for Syria. I also think, personally, that Congress needs to get in the game more than it has. The recent feud with the CIA, between the CIA and President and, uh, and Committee Chairman Feinstein, is a distraction, and I would hope that would be worked out soon. Last week alone, two classified briefings on Syria and Iran uh, that were scheduled before the Senate Intelligence Committee were canceled. There's also an 800-pound gorilla in the room, and that's Ukraine. We can't deal with issues in isolation. How we deal with Russia on Ukraine affects our options with the Kremlin in Damascus and in Tehran. But in the end, I think, I think most of us would agree that uh, Putin has just as much interest in a stable Syria as we do. There is over $10 billion in Soviet-era debt owed by Damascus to Moscow. There's an extremist threat in the North Caucasus and a lease on a naval base in Tartus. So who better to help us understand what lies ahead than the brave former U.S. Ambassador to Syria, Robert Ford, who just stepped down from his post last month. We are honored uh, that this is his first major policy address since leaving office. As a career Foreign Service officer for nearly 30 years, Robert Ford has seen it all. He served as ambassador to Algeria in the Bush administration and was the Obama administration's point man on Geneva II. Uh, Ambassador Ford will first give remarks, I think, or will not Actually, give Actually, no, I don't think so. Ambassador Ford will not give remarks. Um, he will uh, engage in a conversation with uh, the legendary Aaron David Miller, who served uh, six secretaries of state and now serves the Wilson Center as our vice president for new initiatives. The show begins right now. Jane, thank you very much, and, and I want to welcome everyone for coming. Robert, let me just reaffirm something Jane said and begin on a personal note. I, I had the honor and privilege of working o over f almost 25 years with an uh, enormous number of talented and selfless Foreign Service officers. But I have to say that your work on Syria under extraordinarily difficult conditions really reflects a, a courage, a conviction, and a commitment that really is uh, in the best tradition of the Foreign Service. And it's an honor for us to have you here, and it's an honor to, uh, to know you. Well, thank you, but I was always very lucky to work with great teams, both at our embassy in Damascus and then a terrific team in Washington working on Syria. It's just, it's been very frustrating. Uh, I think we'd all agree that Syria is a moral, humanitarian and strategic disaster, certainly for the Syrian people, for the region, and for the United States. What to do about it, however, is another matter. Uh, and toward that end, in an effort to, to see if we can't use your wisdom and experience to elicit at least some on-the-ground intelligence about the, the, the way the political landscape now looks before we turn to the final issue of what to do about it. Um, 
I'd like to ask you four questions. Each relates to a specific piece of the Syrian puzzle. The first concerns the opposition. You have probably spent more time than any other American working with various opposition groups. Can you tell us what drives the dysfunction? Um, how would you um, identify the factors that prevent the emergence of a co-aid effective opposition? And what, if anything, can be done to alter the divisions uh, and confusions that's, confusion that seems to prevail? A couple of things I'd say about the opposition, and I've spent a lot of time, especially with uh, people that are outside of Syria, um, those are the ones that make the most press, um, have spent some time with people on the inside of Syria when they would come out to Jordan come out to Turkey. And so to me, that when I think about the opposition, I actually divide it between an external opposition and an internal opposition. Um, they are divided, it is true, although they're not maybe as divided um, as you might think. I think they all agree on a few basic things. Uh, they, they all agree that Assad must go. Uh, they have a vision of Syria that, for the most part, I'm leaving aside the Al-Qaeda elements, um, but even some of the harder-line Islamists are not trying to impose an Islamic state, although they're certainly going to advocate for one. But there's a difference between advocating and imposing. Um, but they are divided in a couple of ways, and it's, and it's a constant problem. First, there is a huge amount of personal ambition and competition uh, between them. Um, and that has been true from the beginning. Uh, just something as simple as leadership. Um, just yesterday, the internal opposition centered around the northwestern province of Idlib um, rejected the external opposition's attempt to impose a sort of an electoral system to do new elections in that northwestern province of Idlib. And I don't think they're really arguing so much about the forms of elections. They're really arguing over who controls the process. And this gets back into what I said about personal competition and competition for leadership. It's aggravated by regional powers that have their own clients within the Syrian opposition. The Saudis have certain um, people that they like better than others. The Qataris are much closer to some of the hardline Islamists than the Saudis are, for example, the Turks, the Jordanians. And so there is no purely Syrian decision now. This reminds me a lot, and Aaron, you probably know more about Lebanon than I do, but this reminds me a lot about of what I saw in Lebanon, say, in the 1980s when I was a young diplomat just starting out. Um, there is no purely Syrian decision, and that's a real problem. The Syrians themselves and the opposition itself needs to reassemble around a Syrian agenda first and foremost. And, and that Syrian agenda, uh, what, would, what would drive it? I think, as I said, there are some things that they all agree on. Um, I don't think anyone who has any weight on the ground with either the activists that are still keeping municipalities functioning in liberated parts of Syria, the so-called liberated parts of Syria, or the armed fighters, I don't think any of them would accept that Assad stays. Um, certainly not in the long term. I have heard some of them start to say, maybe you know we could keep him there for a few months, but then he has to go. But uh, Assad has no long-term future. I think they all agree on, on that. Second, um, people should be able to go home. Um, food supply should move. You can imagine a whole series of sort of um, steps that they would agree in terms of going forward to rebuild the country and in terms of moving ahead um, to set up a transition government. Um, but then they, they always get snagged up in things mainly circling around who will lead the process. Mm. The Syrian oppositionists don't trust each other and that is the product of living under in a brutal intelligence apparatus driven state for 30 years. And, and by the way, that's not unique to Syria. When I went to Iraq and worked there after um, our troops went in and got rid of Saddam Hussein, um, Iraqi oppositionists were very similar that way. They had very little trust amongst each other. 
So that's a product of political culture. That's, that's not something you fix overnight. Let's, uh, let's turn to the regime. Um, I'm not sure anyone in this room, I'd put myself at the top of the list, would ever believe three years into this <coughs> that Bashar Assad would still not only be in power, but perhaps had turned the proverbial corner in terms of consolidating his gains. And Syria isn't Tunisia, it's Tunisia, it's not Yemen, it's not Egypt. And there are reasons why um, Assad uh, managed to survive the initial uh, phase of the Arab Spring uh, when the others didn't. But in the end, tell us why, what, what is the key to Assad's longevity so far? Why has he been able to sustain himself? Uh, there are three things, really. Um, first and foremost, the opposition that we were just talking about has been very unsuccessful at explaining an agenda that would not threaten pillar the, the communities that are the pillars of support <coughs> for the regime. First and foremost, the Alawi community. The Alawi community, I'm, I've met many of them over the last two years. I've met many of them even in this calendar year. They are genuinely convinced a substantial portion of the Alawi community is not enthusiastic about Assad. They're taking terrible casualties, for example, and they see no end in sight to that, those casualties. The Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, which is not perfect, but is probably as good as any reporting source on numbers we're going to get in terms of casualties, they're estimating that over half of the casualties, over 50,000 uh, regime supporters have been killed. You may assume out of that 50,000, the majority are Alawis. And so that's a, that's a heavy loss for a population that's two and a half, three million max. Um, I live in Baltimore. Um, population in Baltimore metropolitan area is about two and a half million, <coughs> not even three. If Baltimore suffered 25,000 casualties in two years, uh, people in Baltimore would be stunned, would be shocked. Um, but the Alawi community feels it's under attack. Uh, they look at the uh, Al-Qaeda elements that are so strong within the opposition, and they say, they're going to kill us all. And they're not wrong about that. Um, and therefore, they keep fighting for Assad. Um, the other segments of the Syrian political opposition, until November, would not denounce Al-Qaeda, even the most extreme Al-Qaeda elements. They simply would not do it. They bitterly criticized the American decision of December 2012 to name the Nusra Front, which is the other Al-Qaeda group fighting inside Iraq. They bitterly criticized us for naming them as terrorists. And to this day, they won't call them that. The Alawis look at that and not unreasonably say, how can we trust that opposition, even the so-called moderates. So that's one problem here. The opposition has not distinguished itself clearly from the most extreme elements. And it really scares not only Alawis, but Christians, uh, the Druze, a lot of the Sunni business class. Um, that's the first reason. The second reason is the huge assistance from outside states, and I'm talking here in particular about Iran uh, and Russia. Uh, but I would add that there are a lot of, uh, and growing numbers of Iraqi uh, Shia fighters now going in to Syria. Martin Sholov had a very good article, I think yesterday in The Guardian, about uh, Assad al-Haq, the very people that we used to be fighting in southern Iraq and in some parts of Baghdad are now mobilizing and sending fighters uh, to go fight for Assad in Syria, and that helped not only manpower on the ground, which is vital because the Alawi community has taken casualties and there is a war of attrition and they aren't able to mobilize enough. Um, so there's manpower coming in from Hezbollah, from Iraqis, um, Iranian and Russian financing and huge amounts of arms coming from both Russia and Iran. So that's the second factor. And the third factor is that the regime itself has a certain in its center has a certain unity and coherence, which is lacking on the opposition side. So um, you have not seen efforts to uh, remove Assad from within his inner circle. They have remained very united. There are problems with the state, and I hope we get to talk about that a bit. Uh, the state is, the Syrian state under Assad is decaying, it is degrading in the war of attrition. But so far, 
the regime has a certain unity lacking on the opposition side. I mean, there are many people who thought that this, in the end, would become an addition and, and a subtraction problem. That the longer this went on, the regime's asset, assets would be diminished, mm -hmm. uh, its financial and economic resources, its morale, and the time, and that would be, that's the subtraction part of it. The addition part was that the opposition would increasingly g gain strength and momentum. There might be some external support, and at some point, these two arcs would cross in the proverbial tipping point, mm -hmm. when in fact there would be some fundamental change in the situation, mm -hmm. which would start um, the trajectory of, of Assad's decline. Now that clearly hasn't happened for the three reasons that you suggest. And while it's probably not accurate to believe that Assad will, will ever rule Syria in the way his father or he had ruled it, is it possible to imagine as an analytical proposition, mm -hmm. not ask, asking you to endorse this as an act of policy, is it possible, conceivable to imagine a situation in which the regime or elements of it do in fact remain in place and the situation essentially is frozen? No comprehensive ceasefire or unity, but you end up with a sort of stalemate. Mm -hmm. with the level of violence actually declining and diminishing, and you're left with this grinding, uh, dysfunctional, and highly decentralized Syria. Mm -hmm. As an analyst, is that, is that a possible I think that's exactly ending? where we're going. I think that's exactly where we're uh, going. It's hard to imagine that uh, Assad is going in the short term, and even in the medium term, to lose control of the area between Aleppo south to Damascus and then over to the coast, um, which is where most, not all, but most of the big cities are located. Um, some of the cities have been heavily depopulated, um, the d suburbs of Damascus, for example. Um, but it will, he'll control that area geographically. It's maybe a fourth of the country. Um, but the other three quarters will be under the control of different armed elements or contested among different armed elements. I think that's, ex we already see that in places such as Deir Azor, which is out in the east, not so far from the Iraq border. We see that in places like Hasake. Uh, we see that even in Aleppo, where different factions control different neighborhoods of Aleppo. The regime controls the western part of Aleppo city, and the eastern part, neighborhood by neighborhood, is controlled by different armed factions. Sometimes they get along, sometimes they fight. Uh, my third question concerns Assad's allies. You touched on it briefly. I mean, he basically has four. If you don't count the uh, unwillingness of the international community to tip the balance through external intervention, which is in, in, in inherently also obviously helping him, you've got Maliki, you've got Putin, you've got the Iranians, you've got Hezbollah. I'm assuming Ukraine has... Um, uh, well, Ukraine is going to make it almost impossible for the Russians to uh, do much uh, with respect to, to cooperation with us. Hezbollah is locked into um, a struggle of its own in Lebanon and in Syria. Um, Iran strikes me, and, and again, I'm not sure where I come out on this, but is there the potential? You've been around, I mean, you, you were there at the Second Geneva. You've been around the Iranian peace and angle of this. Is there really potential cooperation, do you think, between the United States and Iran when it comes to Syria? And would it be decisive, or would it be significant? We have not had a serious discussion with the Iranians ever about Syria, to my knowledge. I'm not aware that we've ever had a serious discussion with the Iranians to identify what are their core interests, um, what's the top priority set of interests, what is the second ring of interests, what's the third ring building out. I don't think we've ever had that conversation. I cannot imagine that this, the Iranians are anxious to see al-Qaeda sink deeper roots in the eastern three quarters of Syria, the geographic. Uh, eastern three-quarters of 
Syria. I can't imagine that's in Iranian interests. And we've certainly seen al-Qaeda target in a very ruthless manner uh, Shia communities, not only in Syria, but also in, in Lebanon. So, but is that enough, Aaron, to build agreement on a, on a sort of an outcome? That's less evident to me. Mm. I've seen um, Iranian statements this week in the media saying, well, um, if Assad decides to run for re-election, uh, then the opposition should participate, and uh, if he runs and he wins, that's democratic and, and fall into line. And it sort of conveniently ignores that there's this ruthless security apparatus that has never allowed a free and fair election during the Ba'ath and the Assad regimes. And therefore, it's sort of unlikely to imagine they're going to allow it in 2014. Um, I don't know if we're going to be able ever with the Iranians to agree on a sort of a way forward. I think we do share, at a minimum, a counterterrorism yeah. interest with Iran, but will that suffice? I don't know. W one final question, which is obviously the, the toughest, the trickiest, and the most complex, and that involves the American role. Um, I've described U.S. policy towards Syria as not immoral, but amoral. That is to say, the president has made a decision that other factors other than moral, ethical, or humanitarian ones uh, shape our Syria policy. I mean, I described it as a moral, humanitarian, strategic disaster for the United States. It probably is all of that. Um, the question is, and I'll put it to you directly, and I know it, it may not be an easy one, is ending Syria's civil war and the reconstitution of a unified, coherent, Syrian polity, a, a vital, and I choose my words very carefully here, a vital national interest for the United States. And vital means we put our time, we put our money, we put our resources, and vital to me always conveys the sense that we are prepared um, to put Americans in harm's way, a vital national interest it is Syria and the consequences of this un seemingly unending civil war, a vital national interest for the United States? And if so, if indeed it is vital, what should we do about it? <coughs> we have really smart people, um, just in the group that I worked the most closely with at the State Department, starting with the Secretary of State himself, John Kerry, um, spending enormous amounts of time on Syria. Uh, I don't think anyone in the administration questions that we have huge interests in Syria. Um, the interests are also evolving. Uh, we didn't have terrorism and counterterrorism concerns in Syria when the Syrian uprising started in 2011. In fact, going into midway in 2012, we didn't see Syria's posing, uh, or groups operating in Syria, posing a direct threat to the United States aside from the American embassy. And we did receive threats from al-Qaeda in Syria. It's one of the reasons we closed uh, the embassy in February 2012. But I, but to expand on this a little bit, we are spending amounts, huge amounts of resources. If you had told me when I went out as ambassador to Syria in January 2011 that we would soon have almost $2 billion, $2 billion committed to Syria, I would have been shocked. I mean, it's just, so it's, when you think about the time and the resources, absolutely. Um, however, Aaron, the, the interests are addressing the humanitarian crisis, dealing with a growing terrorism security problem, and ultimately, in order to find a sustainable solution to the humanitarian crisis and the terrorism problem, find a political solution 
to the contest for power and therefore channel resources from a Syrian capital against the terrorism problem and to help resolve the humanitarian issue. That, I think, we have been frustrated in finding. And we had hoped that the Geneva II process would unlock um, a start on that. I have to say the regime did not uh, agree at all to discuss a transition government. Um, the opposition, um, with a lot of prodding from us and others, did put forward a transition plan. By the way, they didn't share it with us before they tabled it. Um, but I read it and I thought for a first draft it wasn't bad. It certainly was the basis for a negotiation. The regime's not interested in negotiating either serious power sharing or certainly not willing to discuss Assad's departure. So I think if I can cut to the chase here, and what you're really asking is should we be applying military force? That's right. And so let's... That's what I'm really asking. One of the great things about retiring is I can cut to the chase. So um, I think on that, we should remember that ultimately the solution is not going to be airstrikes against an Assad airfield, as satisfying as that might be. The solution is not going to be drone strikes against regime convoys trundling up to Aleppo. It's going to be a political settlement between elements of the regime and the opposition. The military can't operate in a vacuum. It has to be part of a bigger effort to solve the problem. And on that, we're still stuck. I spent a fair amount of time on purpose talking about the concerns of the elements that support the regime, and in particular the Alawite community, but not only the Alawite community, and how airstrikes are not going to change their calculus in terms of are the opposition crazies going to kill us if we put down our arms. You must address that problem too. That is not a U.S. military strike issue. That's a political issue among Syrians. Right. You've identified, though, the. I, I, I've never talked to President Obama about this, but you, you've identified, I think, the core um, problem. That is the relationship between means and ends. Military power is an instrument. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. It's a tool and an instrument to achieve realizable political goals and a stable end state. You have a president emerging from the two longest wars in American history in which the means and the ends were not well coordinated and the ends were beyond our capacity to achieve. Nobody believes we're going to put boots on the ground. The president's concern, I think, is what is the relationship between the application of military power and the end state that you think is logically and rationally so critically important? That's the key. And I'm not sure anybody has answered that problem. I, I, again, I just, I look at the barrel bombs dropping on Aleppo, and today there are barrel bombs dropped on Dada and also um, one of the suburbs of Damascus. The destruction and the wanton killing of civilians is just completely abhorrent and reprehensible. But that said, I think we should be cautious analytically about what you can expect from an American military action if, in fact, the president were to do that. And the president has never taken that completely off of the table. Um, we should remember the example of Iraq, where we sent in 150,000, at one point, 170,000 soldiers. Here to tell you, while I was in Iraq, Michael was there and others, Michael wrote the great book on it, ultimately the solution in Iraq was not 170,000 soldiers. The deal was between a substantial portion of the Sunni Arab community in Iraq with most of the Shia community in Iraq and the Kurds. They worked out a deal. The 170,000 forces helped in some aspects of that, but the core element that solved Iraq enough to get us out was the political deal among the Iraqis. In Libya, where we had, again, Western military intervention, we still don't have that agreement among Libyans that resolves the problem. The military action is a tool in a tool kit, but it is not the, the solution by and of itself. And I think, I think that's really important. And I, I'm speaking very frankly with this group here. We don't do our Syrian friends a favor 
if we encourage them to think that, oh, if we could just convince the administration to do a military strike, then the problem is solved because it absolves them of doing the hard work of reaching out and undermining Assad's support politically within his own regime. Um, last week, um, out of frustration with what the regime has been doing to civilians, the armed opposition, and in particular some hardline Islamist factions, Nusra and others, um, kidnapped 95 Alawi civilians. Did any of you hear one person in the opposition condemn that? That's the problem. And so how do you convince those Alawis to stop fighting? The opposition's got to advance its own mentality from we need the Americans to do more, by the way, others in the region say the same thing, to how do we work with the Americans to undermine the regime? And that's going to take some hard, hard, hard thinking inside the ranks of the Syrian opposition. Last question, the future. Uh, it's a civil war, it's a, of a peculiar really? sort. And, and a regional war. And, right. you know, and, and civil wars usually end in one of two or three ways. One party bests the other. External intervention tips the balance in favor of one side that then bests the other. Or a kind of exhaustion sets in. And it's a, the frozen, the, mm -hmm. the sort of frozen conflict we, mm -hmm. we described. A year from now, if you were back here, um, March 20, 2015, where do you think we'll be? I wish I could say, as an analyst, I wish I could say, oh, I think we'll have a solution by then, but I, I, I don't see anything uh, quick on the horizon. I think there is an element of exhaustion setting in. You can see that, Aaron, um, in some of these local ceasefires that have been negotiated on the ground between regime fighting units and armed opposition units, especially in the suburbs of Damascus, but not exclusively in the suburbs of Damascus. The regime's tactic, reprehensible as it is, of starving communities, literally starving them, surrounding them and starving them. Why do they do that? Because they don't have enough men to go in and take them. Uh, so they surround them instead in this kind of medieval siege uh, fashion. I can imagine that we'll see more of that. Um, we'll see more uh, local ceasefires, but I don't think in the end it will bring the conflict to a close. It'll simply be a patchwork. The country itself will become more and more cantonized and, and there'll be a patchwork. And I think that's the direction uh, it's going. I see no sign that the regional backers of the regime or the regional backers of the opposition are prepared to stand down. And so there will be plenty of uh, oil put on the fire in the next year. Yeah. Robert, thank you so much. Um, yeah. Sorry, I don't have been, any You've been very patient <laughs> to your questions. Uh, Jane Harmon. Robert, thank you again for your service, your noble and brave service. Uh, two things quickly. Number one, I mentioned uh, the blowback from Ukraine to Syria in my opening. Aaron, in asking you a question about outside influences, said Russia might be too busy at this point to uh, uh, play a bigger role in Syria. But my question is uh, whether or not they actually do it. Everybody has seen the intimidation that Russia was able to effect on Crimea and then the election result and the insertion, oh, by the way, very brilliantly of a, of a covert force. I mean, at least they wore masks. We all knew who they were uh, into Crimea. So does that picture uh, influence uh, and increase the resolve of, of uh, Bashar, uh, Bashar? That's one. Number two, if we were capable, if, if we are capable, and I hope we are, of, of, of reaching an agreement with the Iranians on their nuclear um, uh, bomb um, uh, efforts uh, within six months, is there a possibility that Iran could change its behavior and then on March 20, uh, 2015, you would have a better uh, report? It's very noticeable to me, Jane, that the uh, government in Damascus uh, praised Putin for his um, efforts on Crimea. Um, and welcomed uh, the actions that the Russians took. And I think I, Bashar, for sure, looks at the Russians, along with the Iranians, as his 
uh, his two big protectors internationally, and so I'm sure he takes great satisfaction um, from uh, the recent events in Crimea. That's why they issued that statement. Um, I do hope, um, as we talk about the regime and, and the Russians, the Russians are plussing up weapons supplies going into uh, Damascus, and their political support at the UN remains strong, although the agreement of the Russians to a UN Security Council resolution in February about humanitarian access was the first small chink in the Russian position, which heretofore had been three vetoes and, and warning us off repeatedly. Um, I don't think Bashar should assume that the Russians will remain constant throughout. I think the Russian primary interest in Syria is not the survival of Bashar al-Assad per se. Rather, it is that they don't see an alternative to Bashar in terms of controlling the Islamist extremist element. And they haven't, they don't have something else they can study in front of them to decide if they, they would like that better. That's again a problem of the, of the Syrian opposition. We have always encouraged the Syrian opposition, therefore, to talk constantly to the Russians because they're going to have to convince them that they too would carry out the fight that, and they would do it in a better way, more successfully, uh, than Bashar could. So, um, with respect to the Iranians, I don't pretend to be an Iran expert at all, um, and so I don't know what the uh, impact of a deal, if we came to a final deal with Iran on the nuclear uh, question, I don't know how that would exactly affect their thinking about Syria, but unlike the Russians, I think the Iranians view the Assad regime in a more personal way. Um, someone with whom they've worked closely to help Hezbollah over the years, to help other rejectionist elements. Um, Iran is still a big believer of the resistance front against Israel, much along the lines of the rhetoric that comes out of Damascus. I think, therefore, the Iranians in the end may be a harder nut to crack. I'm not saying impossible, um, but I would expect harder. Yes, um, please identify yourself. Okay, thank you, Mr. Miller. Thank you, Ambassador Ford. Uh, Mohammed al Hussaini, I'm from the Arab League. Uh, you mentioned three factors that uh, kept uh, Bashar Assad in power, sustained him for a long time. But I, th I thought you would consider also the army as intact, homogeneous, Alawite, I meant, or, or uh, the overall majority are Alawites, and loyal, loyalty also, and of course it has all the weapons available, sophisticated. This is one. The other one is that regarding the appointment of the new ambassador, the new envoy to Syria, mm. they said that he's supposed to deal or uh, to get in touch with the Syrians. Mm -hmm. They didn't say which Syrians. The regime, the moderate, uh, mil the militants, the moderate Syrians, the opposition, the militants, what is it? Thank you. <coughs> Um, with respect to the army being intact, um, my understanding is, for example, in the really heavy fighting that took place recently along the Lebanese-Syrian border at Yabrud, um, Hezbollah was in the vanguard mm. of the fighters there, not the Syrian forces. I mean, there were Syrian forces involved, but Hezbollah was in the vanguard. Hezbollah is now fighting as far away as Aleppo. Um, they are using Iraqi militias as well. Um, I think. The, the regime's own units, Syrian units, are either in the barracks because they're, they're not trusted, they're largely Sunni conscripts and their loyalty is questioned, or they're Alawi mainly, but not exclusively, militias, um, and they're taking heavy casualties, as I mentioned. Um, and so the regime is actually, over time, becoming more and more dependent, not on its army, but on foreign forces. That, I cannot imagine, is a source of comfort to Bashar al-Assad, because that also means he's losing a certain degree of independence of decision making. The more dependent you are on foreigners, especially for your military survival, uh, the less freedom of action you will have um, over time. Um, with respect to my successor, Danny Rubenstein, who's a terrific fellow and a brilliant fellow, um, and served with distinction in places like Damascus and in Amman, Jordan, um, I think he just left the United States and um, is headed to Turkey and to Jordan 
and to Paris, and I think we'll be meeting with Syrians, mainly from the opposition, um, in all of those places. I don't know what his schedule is. I didn't set it up. So, um, but I think you will, uh, you should expect um, that Danny will be in close contact with both the formal opposition, but then a lot of independent Syrians, um, and that he will also be in close contact with uh, other countries in the region who have big interests there, uh, starting with Turkey, uh, the Gulf states, Jordan, um, and our European friends. Um, let's see, how about in the middle? Uh, Jared Ferris with uh, Heritage Foundation. What do you make of the prospects for the southern offensive we hear about in the news, um, if that'll make any difference? Let's take one more. Uh, yes, over here on the end. My name is Stephen Short. What outcome do the Israelis wish happens in Syria? Um, not, uh, on the southern offensive first, I don't think I, I've seen these press stories about it to, you know, open the way towards uh, Damascus. I, it's a little hard to imagine that they're going to be able to do a victory parade down the, the streets of Damascus right now. Um, what I understand it to be really, Jared, is it's just one part of a multi-front war of attrition. Um, and so there are going to be a lot of casualties on all sides. Um, frankly, as an analyst, um, one of the things I'm going to look for is um, do we see signs of foreign fighters for the regime going down there? Um, I have been told um, by people in the Free Syrian Army that already there are some Hezbollah elements down there, but I can't prove that. I don't know if that's true. Um, I, but I don't think it will be decisive in and of itself. Um, it's a pretty narrow front, um, and the border with Turkey, which is much longer, has had stuff flowing in for a long time, and uh, that has not proved decisive either. So I wouldn't put a lot of hope in the southern front um, proving decisive. Rather, it says to me that, well, the regime may make advances along the Lebanese border, but then it new problems pop up in the south or in the north or in the east, and um, it, it just never ends. It, it, both sides just sort of fight on and on. Um, with respect to the question about the Israelis, I think they have two interests. Um, number one, I think uh, they remain very concerned about uh, the Hezbollah presence in Syria and uh, the arms that Hezbollah gets, whether those be advanced rocketry uh, missiles or, uh, God forbid, weapons of mass destruction, in particular chemical weapons. Um, and then second, I think they have a genuine concern as well about uh, Islamic extremists and terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda, whether it be Nusra or the Islamic State, the Dawla Islamiyah, uh, setting up um, in any way uh, along their uh, border, along the Golan, um, or taking power in Damascus itself. But in either case, it's not clear to me that the Israelis see their national interests as coinciding with the survival of Bashar al-Assad. That is less clear to me. And I recall a letter from the Israeli ambassador to uh, the New York Times, I think that was about a year and a half ago now, um, where he said point blank, um, Israel's interests will be served um, by the replacement of the Bashar al-Assad regime by something far more moderate uh, in Damascus. Assad himself, um, when I was getting my briefings before I went out to Damascus as an ambassador at the start of 2011, I was flabbergasted um, by the extent of uh, support from Bashar al-Assad to Hezbollah in terms of the kind of missiles that he was providing um, and the kinds of cooperation they were providing out of Syria. So I don't think the, the Israelis have any fondness whatsoever for Bashar al-Assad. I think, is that, is that Trudy Rubin I see back there? Hi, Trudy. I, I, hi, Ambassador Ford. I hope you're getting a vacation, at least. Uh, I get to sleep later in the morning. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> uh, thank goodness for that. Um, 
I'd like to ask you, given the failure of the um, peace talks in Geneva and the queer Russian disinterest in facilitating them, has this led to, or do you think it will lead to, any change in U.S. strategy on Syria? And to be more specific, is there any more willingness now, or is there likely to be, to, to give a green light to the opposition getting from whoever um, anti-aircraft weapons, if for no other reason uh, than to thwart the obvious military strategy of the regime, which is to empty out population centers and let the neighbors deal with the consequences of permanent refugee flows. Should we take one more? Uh, yes. Um, yes. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, I, I do. Oh. There's a glare. Hi, Barbara. How are you? I'm good. Uh, Barbara Slavin from the Atlantic Council and Almonitor.com. Uh, Ambassador Ford, just out of curiosity, had the United States done something more dramatic in the summer of 2012 when there was that interesting bombing in Damascus that killed Asaf Shalkut, that killed the defense minister, and the regime appeared to be on its heels before al-Qaeda got entrenched? Would that have made a difference? Did you advocate for something stronger at the time, whether it was airstrikes or no-fly zone? Or, um, and, and uh, you know, was that a moment that we just missed and we're never going to get that back? Thanks. Um, with respect to Trudy's question about um, a change in strategy, and in particular on man pads, I think, uh, Trudy, there's two aspects to this. Number one, man pads are exceptionally sensitive in general, um, not just in Syria, but anywhere in the world. And I don't think we want to see these kinds of weapons proliferate because of concerns about the threat to civil aviation. So um, it's not clear to me that that concern, which is global and is not specific to Syria, it's not clear to me that that is going to change. Um, with respect to other elements of our support to the opposition, um, it's easy for me to imagine that in the policy deliberations going forward, um, they're going to refocus on how to change the balance on the ground. Um, airstrikes are a big thing that the regime uses, um, but in the end, I'm not aware of any guerrilla campaign that's been thwarted solely by airstrikes. So, Part of what's also going to be important for the opposition to understand is that they're going to have to adapt their own tactics in the Civil War. This is difficult for them, Trudy, because the Free Syrian Army was established back in 2011 to protect civilians. That's where it came from. It started out as informal groups who would scatter around what were then peaceful demonstrations and fire at the police or the um, uh, militias coming in to hold them up so that the demonstrators could disperse and get away before they were arrested. Um, that's where it came from. And they've always had an ethos in the Free Syrian Army of protecting civilians. Well, the regime's tactics have changed. Now if you try to hold ground on the justification of protecting civilians, what the regime does is they either bomb and kill a lot of civilians and there's nothing the Free Syrian Army can do about it because they don't have the right weapons. Um, or the regime surrounds and starves. And again, there's very little the Free Syrian Army can do about that either. So they're going to have to adapt their tactics and become less keen on holding ground and instead focusing more on things like supply lines. Um, uh, with, res with respect to um, Barbara's question, it goes back to what I said before, Barbara, about <laughs> Syrians coming to a political agreement. When the bomb um, took out a couple of the senior leaders, including Assad's brother-in-law, um, Asaf Shaukat, um, and the defense minister at the time, the Syrian opposition at that time was the Syrian National Council, which had no transition plan whatsoever, um, and frankly wasn't even thinking of a transition plan, was thinking that there would be a victory parade down the main streets of Damascus. I don't think even if we had done something <coughs> then, uh, it's not clear to me 
that in even if the regime had toppled, which I'm not at all sure it would have because of the, the internal unity aspect that I was talking about before, but even if it had, uh, I could have just as easily imagined a power vacuum. And the Syrian National Council at the time of that bomb uh, was even less organized than the Libya Transition Council was. So you would have had this sort of vacuum. Um, that's why even in frankly, 2011, after the Syrian National Council was formed, we told them the top order of business for you must be to set up a transition plan and to market it inside the country. Um, I, it was just never a priority for them, frankly. We have an overflow room with an additional 50 people, and here is one question. Hala wants to make sure that I don't overlook that. Um, I would like to know how it is that she got her question forward and others did not. But, but maybe I've worked in the Middle East too long. You have, Robert. Yeah. Um, this question comes from the overflow flow room and it concerns chemical weapons. Mm -hmm. What can you tell us about the status of the chemical weapons effort and what is your speculation on how the regime is, is playing this? Particularly now in, in, um, in the wake of... Um, of Putin's move into Crimea and um, the deterioration in, in the U.S.-Russian cooperation? I think uh, the director of uh, the OPCW in The Hague just issued a statement either this morning or yesterday saying that uh, the regime has now removed approximately just under half of its chemical weapons stocks. Um, but that only about a fifth or maybe a quarter of the really potent stuff has actually been removed out of Syria um, and that they're, they're moving less of the priority one materials, the, the more potent things, and they're moving more of the less potent things. Um, and so there's a real need for vigilance, not a surprise with the history of this regime. Um, and then there's a second issue which is um, the future of the various Syrian regime production facilities. And our understanding of the agreement with the Russians is that those facilities will be destroyed. Destroyed. Um, I'm now seeing that the Syrians are proposing that they simply be sealed shut, which is not the same thing as destroying them. So I think these are things we're going to have to talk to the Russians about. Um, it's, from our discussions with the Russians last autumn, it was clear to us that they saw their own interest uh, best served by seeing the re A, the elimination of that program, and B, the destruction of the materials. So I think we have, we will, you know, it'll be an issue to discuss with the Russians, both the speed at which materials are being removed, and especially the priority one materials, and then second, the future of the, the production facilities. Uh, Amal Mudalali. It's nice to see you, Amal. Thank you. Nice to see you. Uh, Hi, Amal. How are you? Kifak. Amal Mudalali, Wilson Center. At the beginning of your talk, you said that uh, the job was very frustrating. Uh, you're talking about your job or about the policy towards Syria, the American policy. Can you assess that policy <laughs> over the last three years? And uh, um, Ms. Harman said that she would like to see a more forceful policy. Do you agree with her that there should be a more forceful policy on Syria? Thank you. Uh, I think all of us from both in the administration as well as in the Congress and the American public in general uh, look at the stories coming out of Syria. Um, and feel uh, both um, anger, huge frustration uh, that it continues every day. Um, and in a sense, we all want to do something. I don't think anybody questions that. Um, but you want to do something that's actually going to help and that's going to fix the problem. Um, and so uh, we feel huge frustration that we have not been able to stop the killing, that we have not been able to find a way to return Syria towards some kind of sustained stability with dignity and freedom for its people who are incredibly brave. I, I can't underline that enough, 
how brave so many of these Syrians are, these doctors that are working despite hospitals being bombed, um, the people who have stayed to keep uh, basic infrastructure working despite barrel bombing of districts all around them in places like Aleppo, um, or who brave Al-Qaeda um, in places like Deir Azor. We're working with a group in Deir Azor to get schools up and running. And you know how Al-Qaeda feels, for example, about teaching uh, young girls. So um, th just the bravery of the Syrians, I think, touches all of us, touches all of us. Um, it certainly touched me. So um, I, what I can say to you is I don't think anyone is happy in the administration or in Washington in general about the situation there. And so I think you will see us constantly evaluating and reevaluating what is the best way forward. We have time, I think, for one more question. Maybe two if they're quick. Yes. Mohammed Shinaho, so America. Do you expect Syria to emerge as one country after the civil war, or would it be a hot spot for terrorism and sectarianism in the Middle East? Thank you. And we'll take the final question. Yes. Thank you. My name is Mutlu Siviroglu. I'm an analyst on Kurdish affairs. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, during your speech, I never heard you mention Kurds, uh, where they control a large portion of Syria, and they are the main power fighting uh, Qaeda-related Nusra and ISIS. So what is your take on, uh, what do you think about Kurds? Also, our Christian Science Monitor last week, there was a report of, uh, on your comments that the uh, U.S. should talk to PYD, uh, provided that PYD is respecting the integrity and unity of Syria, What's your comment on this? Thanks a lot. Yeah. Um, there are many communities in Syria which I didn't mention specifically. Um, it's, there are a lot of different communities in, in Syria. So uh, with respect to the Kurds, a couple of key things I want to say. Number one, um, they are um, heavily threatened, seriously threatened, by al-Qaeda elements who have been fighting them in places uh, like Tel Abyad and up around uh, Kamishli. Um, and they have, in some cases, they've inflicted real casualties on the uh, Dawla Islamiyah, the Islamic State um, elements that are circulating up there. Um, that said, um, the main group, and it's, again, it's a militia, um, which is controlling a lot of those Kurdish communities up there, which is the PYD, um, has a variety of sensitivities surrounding it. Uh, number one, um, it has an affiliation with the PKK, um, which we and our Turkish friends view as a terrorist organization, the PKK. Um, and so what is the PYD's position about terrorism? That's the first question. Second, the PYD itself um, seizes opposition people and holds them uh, without trial. Um, they are not operating as a democratic force in that northeastern uh, quadrant of, of Syria. Third, the PYD, without reference to any other community in Syria, declared an autonomous zone. The Americans haven't taken a position for or against that. That really is a Syrian decision. It's not something for the foreigners to make a decision about. However, we do think that it's a constitutional question and needs to be addressed within the context of broader discussions about the ruling system in Syria, because just as the Kurds may want an autonomous region, maybe other parts of Syria will want that too. That has to be decided among Syrians, and it needs to be settled politically so that it doesn't become a new source of fighting even after the Assad regime departs. So the way in which the PYD did that actually aggravates political tensions, and it plays, in fact, in favor of the regime in Damascus. So um, there are a lot of questions still about the way the PYD operates and the way it, it, it acts. Which gets then into the question of can Syria be 
can its territorial integrity and its unity be maintained? What I would say on this is um, it's certainly what we want. It is certainly what we want. And it is, I think, very much what its neighbors, Turkey, Jordan, Iraq, Lebanon, and other countries in the region, the Saudis and other states in the Gulf, the Egyptians, and the Europeans and the United States. We all agree that that territorial unity needs to be maintained. But there are a lot of forces, centrifugal forces, pulling at it. The PYD is not the only one. And so the sooner this conflict is resolved politically, uh, the easier it's going to be to maintain that territorial unity. In the end, uh, we had to have a political deal at Taif. And uh, I'm not saying that's the way to solve the Syrian crisis, but again, the focus on politics uh, as the way to resolve the issue. Robert, thank you. Please join me in uh, thanking Ambassador Ford for a terrific conversation. Robert, thank, thank you, you so much. And thank you all for coming. Madam Ambassador, how are you? I tried to attention a million times. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, it's that glare. I'm sorry. Oh, I see, see the how are you, my dear? I'm sorry. Hi, Barbara. You know, I don't even have cards. I've got to get cards. Do you have an email that you could write down? Now I'll have to take you out to lunch to apologize. <laughs> No, not just one minute. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Keep it. Nice to meet you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Claire was an and I will see the idea that I wanted to make a comment as well and thank you for everything. But I had many wonderful visits to the kingdom. I know, I know. That's why I really like to voice my thanks. I'm not. I'm not going to do any more. Truly good to see you. No, Short message, yeah. please. No, no, thanks. Okay. Uh, Inshallah, we should come. Inshallah. 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 Inshall